Good morning. I'm Lewis Higginbotham. And I'm Elaine Higginbotham. We're members of First Baptist Church in Malacca, and we're part of the Praise Life group. All right. Today's lesson is in the Gospel Project, Unit 28, Session 2. It is called Empowered by the Holy Spirit. If you don't have a daily discipleship guide for this, uh, this session, please contact the church office, and we will get a copy of the daily discipleship guide to you. So, Elaine, do you want to lead us out today? Yep, yeah, I'm going to start us off with a question. All right. And the question is, when was a time you didn't realize how helpful something was until it was gone? The, in our dis daily discipleship guide, there on page 20, it tells a little story that answers the question. It's a story of a man who was hired as to work for a shipping company. And he was, uh, you know, loading and unloading trucks. Well, they sent him to a training session in a training center that was well equipped, and that way he could learn how to load trucks and handle the products the way that they wanted it done. Um, the, he, they had big conveyor belts that you put the, the boxes on and they would take them over to the trucks, so it worked out real well for him. Then he got his permanent assignment. He was very excited. He goes to the, to the distribution center where he's going to be working and quickly learns they don't have these conveyor belts. Everything must be carried or put onto a forklift or onto a dolly and moved manually to the trucks. He was certainly missing those conveyor belts that had made his job so much easier. Yeah. Uh, you know, often uh, things that uh, you plan for don't work out the way that uh, you used to. Sometimes you depend upon technology and the technology doesn't work. So, uh, for instance, if your calculator runs out of batteries, it might be difficult to add up your bill. Um, let's go to our first group of scriptures. Have you got those in line? Uh, yes, the first group of scriptures uh, is titled, God's People Have Something Better to Offer the World. And we're going to be reading in Acts 3, verses 1 through 7. Uh, last week, we were in Acts 2, where we had Pentecost has happened. The Holy Spirit has come to indwell the believers. And great numbers of people have been added to the, to the believers. Um, this is what happened next. So we're Acts 3, verses 1 through 7. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. A man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful so that he could beg from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, Look at us. So he turned to them expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then taking the lame man by his right hand, Peter raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. Can you imagine the excitement this man must have felt? A man who had never been able to walk. I mean, from the time he was born, uh, he was a bit of an outcast because if you were lame like this, the current belief was that you were a sinner or that your parents had sinned and that you were not to be, eh, you know, you were kind of a second rate person. He did have people in his life that cared enough about him to bring him daily to the temple. Now, he wasn't a child. He was a full-grown man, man coming daily, <clears throat> begging for what he was getting. But to, I guess at first he might have been a little disappointed when Peter told him, I don't have any silver or gold. But then when Peter told him to get up and walk and then lifted him to, to, so that his feet hit the ground, can't imagine the excitement he must have felt. Well, in the scripture, he's dancing and uh, walking. He's very excited about getting his, uh, his mobility back. A um, couple of things in the scripture. Uh, first of all, 
uh, Peter and John, Peter did not heal this beggar on his own authority. Peter had the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, uh, arise and be healed on my authority. He used Jesus' authority, giving the glory of the healing to Jesus. And that's what we need to do too. When we do something for Jesus, witness to somebody, maybe somebody comes to know the Lord. It's not us that did that. It's the Holy Spirit within us that does that. So we go in the name of Jesus to do these things. Another thing is that uh, he, uh, some of the Bible commentaries I've, I've read said that he will over 40 years old, so he'd been coming to the temple gate every day. His, uh, his uh, friends would take him there and he would beg, earn a little bit of money so that he could sustain his life. Um, most Jews had, had a little bit of money when they were going to the temple. They might uh, be buying something to sacrifice or something and they, uh, they, uh, it was a blessing to them to be able to give money to a beggar um, so um, the man got up entered the temple with Peter and John with Peter and John saying uh, begin walking and praising God you see that in verses 8 and 9 so through the actions of these two men who faithfully followed Jesus God was exalted Another thing is that we see Peter and John for the first time really together. Uh, we normally see them in scriptures or up to this point we see them associated with their brother, but they're together. What do you think about that? Well, when I think of Peter, I always think of him with an action verb. It seems like that's what you, when you read his name in the Bible, there's something he's actively doing. Chopping he, off somebody's ear. Chopping off an ear, going fishing. You know, he, he was doing something. And John, he always seems to me to be more thoughtful, I guess is the word I would use. Disciple that Jesus loved. Yeah. And the um, Peter is the one that denied Jesus. And um, Jesus made a point to be kind to him, to let him know that he didn't hold it against him. But I can imagine Peter still felt guilty for doing that. And that maybe John, being sensitive to this, was helping him to become the leader that he could see him being because, I mean, he was a man of action. Yeah, we absolutely do see Peter uh, leading here. Uh, he's not afraid to heal. He's not afraid to proclaim uh, Jesus as the authority for those uh, for that healing. Um, when we read this account and we put ourselves in the uh, position of Peter and John and actually there were other disciples there with them, part of the uh, 3,000 that had been saved. So there were a lot of people there and uh, when we put ourselves in the position and think about, well, could I heal somebody? Uh, probably not. Um, I'm maybe not as full of the Holy Spirit as Peter was. But it's a special gift. It's a special gift. But uh, maybe we, we should look at ourselves from being the lame man. Sure. You know, uh, the lame man needs healing and without hope. And before we were saved, before we accepted Jesus as our Savior, we were lame men. In our sinful state, our condition compared well to lameness. But like the lame man, through faith in Jesus, we too should get up, get going, and get to praising God for our salvation in Christ. Every Christian begins as a lame man. So the question that we have here on uh, in your daily discipleship guide is what are some ways the condition of, ma of the man, what are some ways the condition of the man who was lame compares with our sinful state apart from Jesus? 
the, the lame man, he was very much an outcast because of his disability. Um, and we are, too, kind of an outcast from God's heaven because of our sin. So that puts us in the same category as the lame man. But because of Jesus sharing the coming to earth and we accepting the gospel, there's a place for us there in heaven. We're reconciled back to God. All right. So in your daily discipleship guide on page 21, it talks about how the Holy Spirit's pr presence in believers' lives, in our life, empowers them to minister to the world in Jesus' name, even if not in healing the lame. Ultimately, ultimately we minister to the world in Jesus' name by sharing the gospel with the world as Peter and John went on to do. And uh, I'll just read a little bit of this uh, uh, paragraph. So put yourself in the shoes of Peter and John and be encouraged by the power of Jesus working through his disciples. We probably shouldn't expect to walk around town healing people, but we have other spirit-empowered ways to minister to the world. And just like Peter and John, we are all called to minister. Our only job is to witness. We're all called to minister to the world in the name of Jesus, watching him do amazing things through us as we share his gospel with the world. Holy Spirit is within us. We're called to witness. We need to be witnessing. Uh, also on that page, uh, A.W. Tozer, a uh, voice from church history says, the spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is the part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We are spirit-empowered Christians. We have a spirit-empowered Christianity. So, Jesus told us uh, in John that his disciple would do the same things that he would do, would be able to do the same things he was going to do or was doing, and they'd be able to do greater things than even he did once the Holy Spirit came to them. Uh, that's in John 14. Have you got that, Elaine? John sure. 14, 12 through 14. Verse 12, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will be also... Let me try this again. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything my name, in my name, I will do it. All right, so this example uh, of Peter he, uh, and John uh, healing the lame man is just one of the many examples in the book of Acts of Jesus' ministry multiplied in the lives of his disciples. The multiplication of Jesus' ministry extends to include all those who believe in Jesus, even us. We are part of that multiplication. God is still doing miraculous things in the world today, chiefly through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus. If we don't see the miraculous results of sinners coming to faith every time we share the gospel, we're prone to be discouraged. We might be ashamed of ourselves for not being able to do the things that Peter and John and the other disciples did. Uh, it may feel like a burden for us to have this great commission on our shoulders and the need to go out and witness, witness to people. It may feel burdensome. It should feel delightful. It should be uh, a delight. Well, it's, it, it can be not a heavy burden because we use the things that we have. Like the man that had the conveyor belt, we have the Holy Spirit that makes the job easier for us to do. 
and not to be so heavy. And also, we, we need to, uh, you know, we may go out and witness and witness and witness and witness, and very rarely do we see somebody come to Jesus. We need to understand that we are not in the results business. Our job to go out and witness, our commandment to go out and witness puts us firmly in the faithfulness business. We need to be faithful to go out and witness. If we witness, then we've done the job that uh, God has commanded us to do, to do and that the Holy Spirit is equipping us to do. Holy Spirit lives inside of us and helps us to keep pushing forward in obedience to the commandment even when it feels hard and when it feels fruitless. Let's go on to our next scriptures. Have you got those, Elaine? Uh, yes, the, it's point two and it says, God's people give glory and praise to Jesus. We're gonna be in Acts three, we're gonna pick up in verse 11. Um, we've skipped a few verses in our reading. What we've skipped is the response of the lame man. He's jumping up and down, and I can imagine that he was probably shouting. He was probably, you know, causing quite a stir there in the hallways of the temple. Uh, and here's what happened next, starting in verse 11. While he, that is the lame man, was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people. Fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk by our own power or godliness? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate, though he had decided to release him. You denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer released to you. You killed the source of life, whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in his name, that's Jesus' name, his name, again, it's Jesus' name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him the perfect health in front of you think about that they they had a crowd following them an excited crowd an amazed crowd trying to figure out what was going on because they all knew that man they'd seen him there probably every day that they had come to the temple mm -hmm. and they knew he was there and now he was walking and he was shouting and he was jumping and the people were astounded and he's hanging on to Peter and John I'm sure he's saying these people these people but the reality was, as Peter points very clearly, it wasn't us. It was Jesus. I used his authority. He's the one that does the miracles. I can't do anything. Right. When we share the gospel of Jesus, when we serve our neighbors in Jesus' name, when we go out and help uh, mow a yard or paint a house or something for somebody that's... Uh, uh, in our church or in our community and needs help. When we see years of prayers in Jesus' name answered, um, we don't take credit for those results. We should exalt the name of Jesus. So follow Peter and John's example of deflecting any kind of credit and glorify the only one whose name has the power to save. We are advancing Jesus' gospel and his kingdom, not ours. So, um, I have another question here. Are you ready for a question? I guess so. Okay, it's, it is so difficult to give glory to Jesus for the works he accomplishes in our lives through us. It should be, why is it so difficult to give glory to Jesus for the works he accomplishes in our lives and through us? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a little bit of pride. We're very 
prideful of what we can accomplish and what we can do. And um, when people say, hey, that was great. I can't believe you finally were able to bring that guy to Christ. Well, we say, well, that we, I did work hard on it. And reality is, you were just the messenger. It was God that did it all. And we need to give credit where credit is due. We need to remember that uh, we can't earn our way into heaven. Salvation was a gift. And there are people that believe that the more you do, you can earn your way into heaven. But we don't believe that. We believe that salvation was a gift. We don't do anything on our own. It's all through the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of His kingdom. Yes. So, I want to uh, point you to the second paragraph on page 22 in your Daily Discipleship Guide. This paragraph talks about who Jesus is, what He has done for us, and how that should lead us to praise His name and work in His power to accomplish His mission. So use the Holy Spirit to accomplish His mission. Um, God isn't trying to make our life harder by giving us the Great Commission to go out and witness. He's not trying to make life more confusing or more stressful. He didn't send Jesus and the Holy Spirit or send us on His missions to add a burden to our life. Jesus is called the source of life and the Prince of Peace for a reason. The burden that we already have or the burden that we had before we gave our life to, to Christ were caused by sin, by asking Jesus to save us, turning away from our sin, repenting of our sin. Then we should have peace, refreshing peace in our life. So we have some fill in the blanks and uh, are you ready for fill in the blanks? I am. These, this one kind of confusing to me because it's not one of the essential doctrines. All the other fill in the blanks, I believe, have been essential doctrines. So uh, you may not have the answer for this one. I do. Okay, the first word is it's. Christ. It's Christ whose name we bear. It's his mission. Mission we are called to join. All glory. Glory to him for our salvation and for the salvation of others. Well, that's a powerful statement right there. It's Christ's name we bear. As Christians, it's Christ's name we bear. It's this mission we're called to join. As Christians and followers of Christ, our job is to go out and witness. That's his mission. All glory to him for our salvation and for the salvation of others. So we don't claim any credit at all about what he accomplishes through us. It's all to his glory. We have our last scriptures. Are you ready for those lines? Yes. It's uh, point three, which says, God's people call others to repentance so they can experience refreshing. We're in Acts 3. We're picking up in verse 17 and 20. Peter is speaking. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your leaders also did. In this way, God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. The seasons of refreshing may come for the presence of the Lord and that he may see in Jesus who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. All right, Jesus seemed to aim at sharpest critiques at the Jewish leaders such as the scribes, the Pharisees, and Sadducees. Now, why was that? As a Jewish man himself, Jesus spoke more strongly towards these leaders than others because they were supposed to be the great theologians. They knew the Hebrew scriptures, the very scriptures that testified about Jesus. Thus, they should have known, based upon his life and ministry, that he was the promised Messiah. But instead of identifying him as the Messiah, they tried to debate Jesus and trip him up. They wanted to disc 
credit and denounce him. And when they thought they had no other option, they put him to death and used the Romans to do it. Still from the cross, Jesus prayed for forgiveness of these people, for they know not what they do. So, ignorance. Luke said that these people acted in ignorance. Why is ignorance not a valid excuse for sin? Well, um, the people that have studied human nature say that we were built to be looking for a God, a higher power. That it's deep inside of us that we are searching for God. Um, nature reflects every aspect of God in what we see. How can we not know it? How can we not see it? We can't pretend like it doesn't exist because we are built for God. Everything that we see in the, this world points to God. Um, only way for salvation, if you are ignorant, is to accept Jesus as your Savior, repent of your sins, and become one of his disciples. So uh, on page 23 of your daily discipleship guide, there's a paragraph about the Jews had a faulty theology that led to a faulty guilty actions. I'm going to let you read that if you want. I want to talk about really uh, the last sentence where uh, his followers through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave them rest and refreshment. And I want to talk, uh, I want to go to my Bible and uh, read a commentary on uh, this verse. So uh, it says that when we repent, God promises not only to cleanse us, to cleanse us of our sins, but to bring spiritual refreshment. Turning away from sin may at first seem painful because it is hard to break old habits and give up certain sins, but, what, but God will give you a better way. As Hosea promised, in Hosea 6, 3, Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the arrival of dawn or the coming rains in early spring. So we all need refreshing. And the way that we're refreshed is to accept Jesus as our Savior, repent of our sins. Holy Spirit comes within us and we are refreshed. Part of this refreshing is also that if we accept the gospel that Jesus was the Messiah, the one that died for our sins, um, it frees us of the bondage of the law. It, it, uh, the law weights us down. It, uh, it, it can be disabling even because we're always falling short of what the law says. Under Jesus' leadership, we are given a break from it. It's a refreshing time of freedom for us. And uh, the faulty theology that the Jews had is replaced by a rightful theology, biblical theology from, uh, from uh, the New Testament. The gospel is that uh, it's all about love. The, the the first commandment really the most important commandment love God and love your neighbor and refreshment then come from being in the presence of the Lord by grace through faith and uh, in Matthew 11 uh, it says that if, if followers would uh, would get rest so we have a uh, a fill in the blanks, and this one is an essential doctrine. So uh, we're back on track here. Are you ready for that? I am. Okay, God is imminent. Uh, that's a strange word. We're going to find out what this this uh, this it's is. It's not the same word as imminent, like 
about to happen. Immediate. No, yeah. no, it's not. It's spelled differently. So God is personable and relatable. Relatable to those made in his image. Image while remaining completely distinct and unique from all of his creation. God is not a distant deity as imagined by the deist who only sits on his heavenly throne with no interaction, but instead he is a personal God who created people in his image to be in personal relationship, relationship with him. So uh, one definition for imminent is uh, existing or operating within. So God is personal. God is with us. The Holy Spirit is in us. The Holy Spirit resides in us. So we're moving towards the close here. The Holy Spirit enables us to fulfill the Great Commission, and that was to proclaim Christ and make disciples and in turn the greatest commandments to love God and neighbor. The healing of the man who was lame demonstrates how God's mission for the church entailed both. Peter showed love for God and John showed love for God by their willingness to reach, teach, and heal in Jesus' name. They also showed love, love for neighbor by their willingness to heal this man who was dis disabled and improvised. And we may not perform miraculous healings, but we should always seek opportunities to serve our neighbor and announce to them Jesus. Tell them about Jesus, who died for sinners and was raised from the dead. Those who repent of their sins and confess him as Lord receive salvation, forgiveness of sin, and refreshment. The Messiah has come, so let's invite others to join us in the season, seasons of refreshing that are yet to come. So uh, what's our charge for this week? What steps are we going to take to focus our life on obeying and giving glory to Jesus Christ in all that we do and fulfilling the Great Commission the commission that we have to go out and witness to others. Have we missed anything? I don't think so. All right. Uh, before we close in prayer, uh, Elaine and I will be uh, not here for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll be uh, celebrating Christmas. Uh, Mark Farrell, who is our teacher, our leader in the Praise Life group, will be doing the video lesson. So please tune in and listen to Mark. Anything else? Yep. All right. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for not only your Son who dwelt among us, but also for your Holy Spirit, dear, dear Father, who dwells within us. Thank you for the salvation that we have and the new life that was given to us through the Holy Spirit. Help us to trust the Spirit's leading and equipping to make Jesus known to others. Amen. Amen. All right. We love you. We miss you. We're in full services this week. Uh, let us know. Contact the church office and let us know if there's a need that you have that we can help you with. Bye. All right. Goodbye. <laughs>